All right, back to my question. Does, do, do, do you all have ponds on your property or work with ponds? One? Okay, well, we'll make this fast then if it's just one. Real fast, because I don't want to be that guy that gets in the way of lunch. Uh, I, too, have come, come out from West Kentucky. I work out of the uh, McCracken County Extension Office for Kentucky State. And mostly what, what I do is largely uh, associated with private ponds, lakes, and the management thereof. So I'm just going to give you a very quick overview, some of the things we look at, kind of all aspects here in about 50 minutes. So it's going to be fast. Uh, one of the bigger issues we, we deal with and, and most of the agents here in the state will tell you this, is that we have uh, issues with leaking ponds. Anywhere where there's karst formations, limestone, sandstone, other rock formations, uh, out where I am, there's almost no geology at all, just a little river stone. There's no rock to be found all the way out in the Jackson Purchase area. But nevertheless, one of the biggest things we want to do is try to avoid leaking ponds. Hardest thing we, we have to, ma to manage out there. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Other things we want to consider. Uh, Avoiding shallow areas, two and a half feet deep at a minimum, is good around the edges. This helps control aquatic vegetation, algae, things you don't want. In most cases, now if you're building duck ponds or crawfish ponds, crawfish production ponds, you want shallow areas. That's about as deep a pond as you want, two, two and a half feet, somewhere in that range. Uh, other things, water quality. What's going on in the watershed? Water, most of our ponds are watershed ponds. Water runs off the hillsides, fills up the pond. Obviously, what's going on in the water, in the watershed, is going to impact uh, the water quality in the pond. And this can be fertilizers uh, from crops, row crops, uh, manures, even lawn fertilizer, this sort of thing. So uh, be, be careful of what's going on in the watershed, and uh, you'll be better off in terms of, in terms of uh, what's going on in your pond. So construction, site selection is very important before you build a pond. Uh, get NRCS help, get all kinds of uh, help that you can get from excavators. Most excavators familiar with building ponds are not going to want to put in a pond that's going to make you unhappy because you're going to call them time and time again. You've got a hole in your property that um, is going to be pretty hard, hard to fix. So get advice. We have advice here at the Extension Service. Uh, your fish and uh, game uh, biologist, just about any place you can get advice, uh, NRCS, and these are just a few of the, the rules, some generalizations, and every pond site is different about what you want in terms of what uh, for your pond. Maybe a three to one, five to one uh, ratio of, of watershed to per acre a pond, uh, wooded soils uh, and sandy soils, you can see that can be up to the 30 to one ratio versus a grassland pasture type situation. So know what you're getting into when you do this. We have publications on pond constructions. Pond construction, unfortunately, we have uh, publications on pond, how to fix leaky ponds, and that's a whole different ballgame. That's something we really want to try to uh, stay away from if we can. A proper clay content, at least 20% clay in the soils, maybe about 30%. I prefer uh, putting these down in compact six inches uh, six inch layers of compacted blankets. It's got to be a, a, a proper moisture content. You can ball it up in your hand. It shouldn't stick. If it's too moist, it'll, it won't compact well. If it's too dry, it won't compact well. It's got to be just, just about right to get those six inch blankets down. Very quick overview of what a dam looks like. Uh, this is a core trench. This is your best quality, tr best quality clays dug in to the ground here. This forms a key or a lock, a keyway. This keeps water from running along underneath the dam and blowing it out. This will stop the water right here. This is really important in most soil types. So if you don't have a keyway or a core trench in your pond, you run the risk of, uh, run the risk of dam failure. Just some things to know about. Again, all, all this can be properly engineered. Three to one, four to one slopes are good on the levee sides. Uh, 18 inches of freeboard, the distance between the top of the dam, or two, inch, or two feet of water, uh, two feet of, of freeboard from the top of the dam to the top of the water is about all you need in a properly engineered pond. And there's, I don't know if there's a picture of it, and if you have watering uh, drains, any structure going through the dam in terms of plumbing, you need an anti-seep collar, all right? That keeps water from moving along the outside of the pipe, 
causing dam failures. I don't think I have a picture of that here, but it is important. Otherwise, water will move along the outside of the pipe and over time whittle a hole in your dam and uh, could possibly call fa cause failure. As I said, pond, pond seepage, leaking ponds, are some of the most difficult things we have to overcome. In some cases, economically speaking, they really can't be fixed. Uh, line ponds are very expensive. I'm going down to Frankfurt in a few hours to look at a line pond right, uh, right after I get done here, after lunch. Uh, all kinds of problems with these, and they're very expensive to build. So be careful of how you do this. The lining material can cost dollars per square foot. Uh, labor costs here, these are class D guys here, so the labor costs are fairly cheap in this project. But um, the truth of it is they can be very expensive to put in. This is a three-quarter acre pond, I think, in the 1990s. This one cost about $30,000. So it's an expensive option. We can make ponds hold, but it will come at a steep price. Uh, getting on to this, mostly what I'm going to talk about is the recreational aspects of pond management, uh, sport fishing, these sorts of things. In terms of, of ponds well suited for sport fishing, we want ponds about a half acre in size would be ideal. This is a good one right here, minimum depth about six to eight feet. You don't need a lot of water to grow fish. I realize our ponds are deep in places like this because of the topography, the, the steepness of the land, but just remember really it's that top six or eight feet at the most of, of, of the pond water, first six or eight feet of that uh, pond water volume that's gonna produce your fish. The rest of it, it's really kind of more of a liability and we'll get into that later. Uh, banks and dam, th this is an important one, Keep trees and woody vegetation off the dam, bushes, that sort of thing. You can have all kinds of stuff growing around the edges if that's what you like, but keep woody vegetation off the dam. Uh, when those trees or bushes die, again, those roots will rot, and that cavity will provide a waterway through the dam and possibly call, uh, cause failure. Conflicting uses is another issue. Uh, irrigation, there's some, there some other uses for ponds that aren't real conducive to... Uh, aren't real conducive to fish production. Irrigation pond, for instance, be drawn down way in the late summer, in the early fall when you might be doing your irrigating, might not be enough water of good quality to grow fish in, it's just a consideration. Uh, maintaining livestock and managing them, don't let them trample into the, into the pond and use this as a bathroom in here. Again, another way to save your pond, keep your cattle healthy, and, and also maintain better water quality either gravity feeding or else in a lowland pond such as this, a gravity fed water tank system, or in a situation like this is in a bottom, they just limited access around the pond just to a couple drinking areas in this two acre pond to allow livestock to get in there. They'll trample a bit of the bank, but they're not gonna trample the whole uh, perimeter of the pond. Uh, to establish good fishing, these are fish species you want. And this is important because people have a way of throwing all kinds of stuff in their farm ponds and then being unhappy with the results. Um, the, the species in question here, largemouth bass here, bluegill, red ear sunfish, channel catfish if you want them. These two are optional. These two form a predator prey uh, situation, excuse me, um, in which um, the bluegill provide food for the bass, the bass keep down the number of bluegill. If you stock these fish accordingly in, in the right numbers, uh, you will you'll have a good predator prey population in there and they will feed each other pretty much. They'll take care of each other. You don't need to uh, add artificial feed. These species can be added as a supplement if you want them, but they're not critical. These two are. Maintain that predator prey balance. Um, Ideally, we'd like bluegill probably somewhere up in the six inch range, a quarter a pound, largemouth bass up over a pound. Most pond bass are gonna be in the one to two pound range, and those are the ones that are gonna do the, most of the work in the pond. So keep that in mind. We want harvest sized fish of good quality and good condition. Species you don't want. Okay, to review, anything other than these, you don't want. The problem with these other species, 
Crappie is a great fish. Everybody in Kentucky loves crappie. Fish and game department will tell you this is a big water fish. Probably ponds, lakes suited 50 to 100 acres in, in surface area. These other fish, all these fish here that you see in this picture have a habit of reproducing like fruit flies in a pond, tiny young, and they can, they can stun at a very small size. Two, three inch bullhead, this little square tailed catfish right here, can reproduce yellow perch probably at two or three inches in length. They will just stunt down, mature at a very small size, and you can have a pond full of them. You have to trust me that it's a whole lot easier not putting these things in your pond than trying to get them out later. Uh, getting them out later often involves uh, poisoning the water, getting rid of the entire fish population, and starting over again. In Kentucky, it's probably going to take you a year to two years to get a good fish population in your pond. So this is not something you want to mess up and waste a lot of time and some money uh, waiting for fish to come along that you can stock because you've stocked in species of fish you don't want in your pond. Uh, so let's talk about fishing. A lot, I, I get a lot of uh, landowners now that call, they've bought, they've bought some farm property, it's got a pond on it, they really don't know, they really don't know what condition their pond is in. Uh, assessing the current fish population, sounds difficult. Does it provide good fishing? That's really what we're trying to do here, so that's what you've got to go out and try and do. If you really want good fishing in your pond, you're not a very good fisher, fisherman, fisherwoman yourself, send somebody out there that is. Uh, I get a lot of complaints about ponds that have no good fishing in there, and then we'll go out and we'll test saying we'll rote known it or all this other stuff, and we'll find out that the fishermen weren't very good. There's plenty of fish in there. You've you got to go out there, Number of times during the summer, the spring, whichever, different baits, send out different people if you're not very good at this yourself. Really try to get a good idea of what's, what's going on out there. Uh, there are some options. We'll get into a little bit of that. Remedial stocking is kind of iffy. We can try to stock large fish on top of an existing fish population. But honestly, if you've got largemouth bass out there, such as this guy is holding up here, Really, you've got to stock fish that are probably 10 inches or longer. This goes for catfish, this goes for grass carp, anything else. Because a fish like this has got a huge mouth. They're called for largemouth bass for a reason. And they can eat any smaller fish and will gladly do so if you provide them. So if you go in there and you stock six inch catfish fingerlings, you're just feeding guys like that. They're not going to survive. They're not big enough and they're not fast enough to get away from a fish uh, like a good, what, three or four pound largemouth bass, such as what you see here. So anyway, uh, final end product. If all else fails, we can go in there with a chemical. Wrote known, it's a restricted use pesticide. Uh, in the fall of the year, probably September, October is best. Knock out everything and start over again. Most people are not really inclined to do that, but it is an option. Uh, most of our ponds are underfished. So if you are going to determine the quality of your pond in terms of fishing, the best thing is to go out there and fish it pretty hard. Don't go out there, you know, once every six months and say, not catch anything in a half hour, say there's no fish in there. That's not how it works. Uh, there are times where even some of the best fishermen won't, won't uh, catch anything. So go out there and, and give it some, uh, give it some uh, effort. Uh, some things we can do uh, after the, uh, the warm months come here, probably June, July, we can go out and do a little test seining. And this is a small seine, and we're just looking at a qualitative situation. We're looking for young of year bluegill, probably in the inch to two inch range. Also, young of year bass. They look just like, look just look just like the adults, but they're again a couple three inches long, and uh, they have a big black stripe going down the side of them. And uh, we're just trying to make sure that one, we've got another year class of fish coming on. So we're looking at young of year fish populations in the warm season of the year. By June, July, throughout the state, uh, spawning should be going on. Also, we don't want to find unwanted species in there. We don't want to find those square-tailed little catfish, the little bull, bull heads uh, that can be so prolific and are about the hardest thing there is to get out of a pond. There are things in there that we don't want. I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is a largemouth bass in the middle. It's got a little black stripe going down the middle of it. Two young a year bluegill. Young a year bluegill are easy to tell. You just about see through them. They're, they're uh, translucent. You see the skeleton in there and some of the, uh, the innards and all that. So uh, 
It's real easy to tell, just the small fish in the population. Every once in a while, we'll get lucky and catch a larger fish. When you catch fish in general, larger fish, check, check their condition factor. If a fish is, is starving, it's going to look like it, it has, uh, it looks emaciated. It's got a pinched in gut. It's mostly head and fins. Uh, you don't have to be a fish biologist to determine that the fish is not getting enough to eat. Uh, we, we get into a lot of stunted fish populations now. We've got 10-inch bass uh, populating a pond and really nothing much bigger. 10-inch bass has got a mouth on it about this big around, so it's hard to catch anything else. Uh, what's happening now is people are not taking fish home, and I'm guilty of this as well, taking fish home like they used to. They catch them and throw them back in the pond. Well, over time, the size of the bass goes down and down and down, and the numbers go up. So you are going to have to remove some bass from your pond, depending on how fertile it is, uh, just to keep the size of those fish up. Otherwise, you wind up with a pond full of 8, 10-inch bass. They're real healthy. They're reproducing, but that's all you're going to have. So you're going to need to harvest some bass, but not too many. It's an art. It depends on pond fertility. It depends on the size of the pond, all sorts of other uh, other factors, but you'll know if you fish the thing often enough what's going on. Uh, these are just a, a fertile pond in Kentucky, much out where I live, easily produced two, three hundred pounds of bluegill and a bass. That's a standing stock at any time per acre. So there's a lot of fish that can come out of a farm pond. Does anybody know how many fish the average person eats in this country in terms of pounds per capita of consumption? Okay. I wouldn't expect you to know this. It's about 16 pounds. So a farm pond can feed a family of four for quite some time, given that the average person may eat, what, 15, 20 pounds of fish per year. So a farm pond can actually provide quite a bit of food for a family that's willing to go out there and get them. Uh, stocking rates, I should mention that the uh, Kentucky Fish and Game Department Division of, of, of Fish and Wildlife no longer stocks ponds. They stopped this, I don't know, four or five years ago. So these are some, these are some uh, numbers he cobbled together from those initial stocking rates. Remember, this is from a pond that has no fish in it, either a new pond or one where the fish population that was in there has been wiped out. So these are small fish going into an unstocked pond. Typically, two to three inch uh, bluegill, probably about 200 per acre in the fall of the year. Oftentimes, uh, I'll put a catfish in at 50 fish per acre if you want catfish in there. Again, channel catfish, the fork-tailed catfish, not the square ones. They've got a fork in their tail. And if you want those in there, they're a good fish to have in your, in your pond. They're not critical. Oftentimes, uh, two to three inch fish uh, in terms of largemouth bass, about 60 per acre in the spring. That's the uh, <coughs> recommended stocking rates. And... Uh, and what we'd be looking for there. Uh, it gets much trickier, again, if you've got large fish in the pond and, um, and uh, you're trying to stock fish on top of it. It can be very difficult. But this is what you would look at for a new, new pond or a reclaimed pond, as we would call it. And uh, this should provide you that bass-bluegill dynamic where the bass will feed on the bluegill and the bluegill will provide forage fish, essentially, for the bass. Uh, it, it does work pretty well in those combinations. I know some of you might be from Ohio. Midwestern, southern states all have a, a stocking regime similar to this for bass bluegill populations in their farm ponds. It might be a little different. Your fish and game department from whichever state you're from uh, has a little booklet uh, about these things. Unfortunately, Kentucky's is out of print right now. Not something I'm real happy about, but uh, that's the state of the state. I know Ohio has a pretty good one. I've looked at it. Um, again, Excuse me. <coughs> we're, we're left now. We're left now to buy fish from these trucks that come around to feed centers, farm supply stores, this sort of thing. Since the fish and game department is out of stock, uh, out of the business of stocking fish, uh, larger fish can be expensive. The larger they are, the more ex expensive they can be. It's difficult to know just exactly what you have out in a pond, so it's hard to remedial stock fish. If you don't think you have enough bass, you can buy some big bass and put them in there. But big bass are probably going for somewhere to the tune of, oh, I don't know, $10, $12 a fish for a 10-inch fish. So uh, they get pretty expensive as they get larger. 
Also, again, if you've got large bass out there already, remember this, 10 inch fish or longer to stock on top of a mature bass population, or basically you're just bringing a seafood restaurant to them by throwing little fish in there. In fact, if you do it often enough, they'll sit there and wait for you. It's pretty discouraging. Uh, uh, even small ponds, another option is if you don't want to do this, even down to an acre or something. Uh, you can stock just catfish and feed them fathead minnows and or feed them. If you want to go that route, that's another option. Fathead minnows can get expensive over time. Fathead minnows are so slow that bass and catfish and everything else will pretty much eat all of them. If you want to stop, stock fathead minnows, they call them crappie minnows around here, rosy reds. Uh, you can do that in your pond. It's just you buy them by the pound and it can get expensive. The bass absolutely love them and mop them up. So uh, that's something you can do if you want. If you just want channel catfish in a pond uh, instead of the bass bluegill scenario. Uh, if all else fails, we can go out there in the fall of the year with a chemical called rotenone. It's been around for a very long time. It is a restricted use pesticide. Uh, the game department prefers that one of us fish and game people or somebody like myself from the extension service is out there before you apply this chemical to the pond. We don't want this to get out into streams, overflow the pond, streams, waterways, rivers, because wherever this stuff will get in small concentrations, it will kill fish. So uh, be advised of that. I've written a paper on it. Uh, it can be done if we want to, if you want to do, go that route. Depending on water temperature, it'll take probably one to four weeks uh, for the, the chemical to dissipate in the water and be ready for you to restock. So you want to be careful of that. You don't want to stock too early and kill fish uh, from the residual of the chemical still in the water. Uh, here's just a, a, a pond that I did wrote known when I worked out of Somerset. It was a neighbor's pond, and it had no bass in it. And you can see these are mature crappie right here and probably mature bluegill populations. Three-quarter acres, and those fish are all head and fins and not much else. Undesirable population unless you're a blue heron or something like that that used to like to work this pond. If you pull all the bass out of your pond, have no predator control, it'll go on, along just like this. These fish will overpopulate, and these are probably breeding size fish right here. Not, not ideal for fishing. So uh, some other things you can do. A lot of people enjoy feeding fish. Most of your feed stores, many of your feed stores, I should say, will carry a floating fish food. Folks will throw out a few pounds a day during the warm weather. The catfish, the bluegill, the grass carp, the turtles, the ducks, everything loves fish food. Dogs, um, largemouth bass generally won't eat fish food a prepared diet unless they're trained on it, but they will be under there eating all the small fish that have come from the, uh, for the fish food. So uh, they, they will uh, hit the smaller minnows and the smaller fish. Ag limestone, I don't recommend you go about it this way, but adding ag limestone, if your water's soils have low pH, if you're living in a limestone rich area like I see around here where there's a lot of limestone, this probably isn't an issue. Uh, standard liming rate I use out in Graves County, McCracken County, where I live, probably somewhere four to five tons to the acre. And our limestone is not that great out there. It's probably about 60% reactive, something like that. I don't recommend most people fertilize their ponds. The Fish and Game Department and I disagree on this. Unless you're a really hardcore fisherman um, and really want to push your pond hard, I don't recommend that you fertilize your ponds. Uh, if you run a sportsman's club, if you're an avid fisherman, we'll talk about it. Once you start fertilizing a pond, the pond and the fish in it become dependent on that external source of nutrient, and you've got to keep it up year after year. Probably somewhere eight to 10 applications, spring, early summer. And, uh, and that, that can be a, a, an expense and something that most people don't want to get involved in. Aeration, I'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute. It's good insurance policy for your pond. If you have electricity or something near your pond uh, structure, uh, near the, the, the bank, uh, that's, that's good to get into, but it is expensive. Uh, again, I'm not sure how appropriate this is. I know Western Kentucky, parts of Southern Kentucky and Eastern Kentucky in particular, uh, where there's no limestone in the soils, no, no karst geology, uh, keeping alkalinity up is important supporting uh, fish populations. 
We want to stabilize pH, keep the pH from moving around on a daily basis. This allows the, the fish to put more energy into growth. And needless to say, it's a whole lot easier to lime a pond that's not flooded than one that is. Uh, for flooded pond, you pretty much just go around the pond the best you can in dry conditions and blow some limestone in there the best you can. Just ag limestone. I can do a small, uh, an easy water test at my office. We're looking for alkalinities of greater than 30 milligrams per liter. Ideally, alkalinity, the buffering capacity of the water, should be up around 50 to 100. That's desirable. And we would like to have pond muds near a pH of 7. So you look at an alfalfa liming recommendation. We use the alfalfa liming recommendation that UK has for our ponds, because we don't have one specifically for pond liming. You can't really put too much lime in a pond unless you absolutely fill it up. There's just a point, there's just a point where it's not going to be of benefit to you anymore. If you've got real cl clear water like this pond over here, uh, pH was pretty low in that one, probably around five, something like that. Your, your pond is a good candidate to uh, try adding ag limestone in. Well, the idea is to go around areas of the pond much the way you would as a field. Uh, we've used big pieces of pipe, like PVC pipe, and kind of get a core from a boat, dry it out, and then you can send it in for, like I said, and, and under the, and I don't know where we are with the soil testing program at UK. That's another issue, but uh, then ask for a liming recommendation for alfalfa. That'll get that soil pH probably up six, eight, seven, something like that. I do. The problem is, the problem is with water pH is that it fluctuates. Water pH in the morning is at its lowest, and in the afternoon it's its highest, right before the sun goes down. So in a poorly buffered situation, in a pond like this, there's a lot of algae and plants in here. In the morning, this pH might be five, but by the nighttime, it, it, could, be, it could be eight or more. So that's a thousand-fold increase in pH. pH is a good, a, a good snapshot as to what's going on at the time, but it's not a real good indicator of what's going on there long, long term. When we look at alkalinity, this is the ability of the water to buffer acids. Mostly what we're looking for is uh, bicarbonates and carbonates. That's primarily what we're looking for. So we add limestone, that's calcium carbonate. We're adding carbonates and calcium to the system. We're improving hardness and alkalinity. And that's why in our areas that have more acidic soils, we recommend liming, same as you would a, a, a field. Well, we, we tend to hit it pretty hard, but there's really no such thing as too much ag limestone in a pond. We go through all this science, we take all these tests, we call up the quarry, and then they tell us, well, You've got a quarter acre pond, and they say, well, we've got a 10-ton truck or a 20-ton truck. Which do you want? So it's nice to know how much you need, but it's not always practical when you go to buy uh, ag lime. Again, I, I touched a little bit about fertilization. I'm not negative on pond fertilization. It's just more work than most people are willing to get into. And for that reason, I, I'm hesitant to, uh, I'm a, I'm hesitant to uh, encourage people to do this just because it takes a lot of work and, and some expense and it has to be done every year, year after year after that's done. First of all, the lime requirement has to be met in the pond before you do any fertilization. Secondly, you can't have any aquatic plant problems in their algae, nuisance plants, uh, or, or else you're going to have a situation in which, uh, in which the plants will, will uh, grow wildly. This is pretty much throwing gasoline on the fire. Limiting nutrient in fresh water is phosphorus. Uh, again, uh, feeding is something a lot of people are interested in doing. Uh, a, a few pounds of fish feed a day is not going to affect the pond dramatically in any way, and a lot of folks will enjoy watching the fish come up to feed. Aeration is a, is a good practice if you can afford it. Uh, aeration. Units probably start somewhere around $1,000 now. They're not cheap. A half, three-quarter horsepower unit for an acre of water uh, is about what you'd want. You can put these on a timer. You want to run these, generally speaking, at night, probably from 10 at night to 10 in the morning, something like that. 
You don't want to run them during the daytime, generally speaking. And they'll provide a refuge for fish to come in here where there's oxygenated water. When the rest of the oxygen has decreased in the rest of the pond, they can come here. It's kind of a life support system. Uh, aeration, stratification is a big problem, and we get a lot of calls on fish kills every year. Uh, pond structures, you can put these things in. I'm more of a fan of things like Christmas trees and cedar trees that you can, that you can put in relatively shallow water and remove if you want to. Um, don't, don't get involved in things that are really heavy and take cranes and, and tugboats to remove from your pond. This way you can kind of just pull these things out if you feel like you've got too many small fish in your pond. I, I, most of the questions I get, or at least half of what I get on plants, is uh, a, aquatic vegetation control. So we're going to talk a little bit about this. One, we need to know what the pond's being used for. Is it, are we watering livestock, irrigating, uh, water and turf, such as a golf course might do? We really got to know all the uses for that pond uh, before we start making any recommendations, especially when it comes to chemicals. We'll need to know a little bit about water chemistry and also the physical nature of the pond. This one up here in the top, uh, identifying the plants or algae first is critical. A lot of the, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, the, the information we get is wrong. Folks don't know their plants, so it's hard to solve a problem if you can't identify it correctly in the first place. So that's what we'll set out to do. Our plants are pretty much arranged by their overall ecology, either submerged plants completely underwater, uh, floating or emergent. Emergent plants are ones that grow in the wet soils and stuff, but have some parts sticking up out of water. Cattails, lily pads are a good, are a good example of emergent plants. Free floating would be things like duckweed, and we also have various types of algae, which I'll, I'll run through here in a minute. Methods of control. Most of you have seen these types of things, uh, mechanical, mowing, cutting, pulling. Physical, pretty much fertiliz fertilizers, uh, we use dyes sometimes. Uh, biological, at least for our small ponds and lakes and in Kentucky, pretty much limited to triploid grass carp. Uh, we, we don't really have any other types of biological controls at this time. And also chemical, liquid and granular herbicides, algicides. Those are pretty much the approaches that we might take. A mechanical removal, as you see here, this is good if you've got a strong back and not a whole lot to do. Uh, younger days for me, maybe, but uh, physical. Well, many of you have seen these, these uh, dyes that you can put in ponds and lakes. Some people like them, some people don't. Uh, it's food coloring, essentially, of various colors, reds, blues, greens. Uh, blacks, you name it. Um, in this, in the case of this, about one gallon treats a surface acre. Cost is relatively, relatively small, uh, and it lasts a long time if the if the water stays in the pond, if there's good retention. So um, you'll you can consider that. I don't particularly like the looks of it, but some people love it. You'll see it in golf courses, municipal parks, and stuff will use it. Uh, but you know, teach their own. How good a job it does at controlling algae and plants is really anybody's guess. It doesn't work real well in the shallowest areas of the pond where you need it the most. Water of one, two feet. Sunlight's still going to penetrate all the way through the water column to the bottom, and up that stuff will come, all the unwanted plant material. If it works for you, I don't, I don't have any problems with its use, uh, but I'm not sure it's a silver bullet for plant control. But it is out there, and a lot of people sell them. Uh, grass carp, again, stocking large fish in the presence of largemouth bass will suit you well. Uh, the fish can be fairly expensive, uh, you know, $12 a piece, something along those lines. Uh, they will eat so soft stem vegetation, easily digested material. Uh, branched algaes, they're not going to eat things like cattails, water shield, um, water lilies, the tough, the hard to digest plants. And you can stock any number of them per acre. Now, 50 per acre is ridiculous. I don't think I'd ever do that. But um, somewhere 5 to 15 per acre might be uh, a normal rate, depending on how bad the aquatic plant problem is. These things also grow quickly. 
And once they get up over 10 pounds, they get kind of fat and lazy. So every few years, you're going to have to put new ones in. Problem is, is getting the old ones out. These are some of the strongest fish around. They'll absolutely beat you to death if you try to bear hug a 30-pound grass carp. You'll regret it. Uh, so if you're a bow hunter, if you've got any inventive ways to get these things out of the water, be my guest. But if you go out there with a net, be careful because they are tough. I've handled a lot of big fish, and I'm not sure I've handled anything stronger than a grass carp. And this is like a missile head right here. It's like a sh almost like a spearhead. And uh, you don't want to have one of those things charge into you. They, really, uh, they can really put the hurt to you. So be careful if you decide to try to remove these by hand. Again, wet finger in the wind, uh, stocking rates for grass carp. This is more of an art than a science for sure. They're not going to eat everything. But they will preferentially feed on some types of plants versus others. A filamentous algae control. This is probably the one we get the most calls on. Uh, we can use any kind of a number of algicides. You can see this shallow pond area here has got these mats of hairy kind of moss, mess, whatever people call it, scum. Uh, you can use copper sulfates. Peroxide-based uh, peroxide based algicides, diquats, chelated coppers, there's a number of things we can go after with algae. The problem with algae is it generally, re it generally comes back in about three, two to three weeks. It's tough stuff to keep, keep under control. Uh, copper sulfate's been around since the 1950s. I put this in a melt, dissolve the crystals in a sprayer, a plastic sprayer, something like that, and spread it out there. Don't broadcast the crystals out into the pond. They'll just sink in the muds and they won't, they'll get locked up into the, in the pond muds and not work very well for you. So make sure you dilute this in, in uh, warm water, spray it out there if you can. If you use any kind of metal equipment, make sure you run some uh, fresh water through it after you're done. Or it'll, Stuff's highly corrosive and not at all good to get on you, so be careful when you use this stuff. Chelated coppers, uh, a variant of regular old copper sulfate that's been around forever. This stuff is more expensive, supposed to be less toxic to fish, better for the environment, uh, and supposed to be effective longer as a form of algae control. Uh, it is more expensive, so uh, keep that in mind. If you have a small area to a small area to uh, treat, then that's a pretty good, a pretty good uh, uh, way to go. Blue-green algae. Anybody getting blue-green algae questions? We got hundreds of them this year. Uh, it's a big concern in our, our swimming waters, our drinking waters, where pets, livestock is concerned. Uh, it's, it's a real problem. Uh, people have taken notice to it now. There's a lot of questions about some types that are toxic, some types that aren't. And the answer to all that is yes. Uh, the problem is that some of the toxic organisms go through stages where they may be toxic and they may not be. And it's really hard to tell. You have to have a lab pretty much determine which types of blue-green algae are toxic. So if you see green out in your what looks like paint, green paint, sometimes it can even be a yellowish color or blue, uh, some unnatural color out there, you might want to keep your dogs out of there certainly your family members, and if you have an alternative to watering horses or livestock, you may want to consider that as well. Some of them are, are toxic. Uh, the testing is not nearly what I would like it to be. It's slow and expensive right now, and these things can change toxin levels within a few days. So if we send a sample off to the lab one week, well, the next week it might be toxic, or the week before it wasn't. So there's difficulties right now in establishing the toxic nature of blue-green algae blooms. This is not a very good picture over here, but sometimes this looks like somebody spilled John Deere color type paint in the water. So you're going to have to hang with us. What we would really like is something that we can pretty much field test these types of situations with, one for toxic organisms, and two for the level of toxicity that's in the water. The level of toxicity, the concentration of toxicity in the water is even more critical than whether the organisms are, are the toxic organisms are present or not. So uh, we're, we're unfortunately on the, uh, on the edge of that. We really don't know an, enough about it right now. So the, the cautionary words, if you see this stuff out there, you might want to think twice about exposing uh, either yourself or animals or 
children or anything else to it. Uh, Pythophora, this is just another type of filamentous algae. <coughs> Tough wo woolly stuff. We see it almost feels like felt when you wring it out. Uh, we see this in the uh, late summer, early fall. And this can be controlled, as can all of these, with a number of, uh, of types of algicides. A reward is a, a non-selective herbicide and algicide. It will work on a lot of these different uh, types of uh, algaes and, and vascular plants, for that matter. Uh, I like it because it's relatively inexpensive and readily available. Uh, there, are, there is a livestock restriction on it. I believe it's one day. Uh, but it can be used in a number of different applications. And uh, the thing I like about it, particularly in rural areas, uh, you can actually get your hands on this stuff uh, fairly quickly. Some of the other plants that we'll see uh, very quickly running through these are willows growing around a pond. Willows and cattails, as soon as you build a new pond, probably within a year, you'll start to see small black willows coming up and cattails coming up around the shoreline. If you build it, they will come. They start out in the shallow waters and they will work their way pondwards, at least the cattails will. The willows eventually will line the entire bank. Uh, so mowing, cutting, spraying, whatever, whatever you want to do to try to get, keep these things under control uh, will work. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a stand of cattails in that background in the corner there, and you can see it's working at, they're working their way pondward in that picture. Again, cattails, uh, rushes and sedges, often treated with glyphosate. There's some other heavier duty uh, Herbicides we can use out there. I like using non-ionic surfactant with this. Often it's going to take multiple treatments on this. Don't let these stands get up real thick to where you can't hardly get through them. Uh, start, if, you, if you want some control, start spraying them, pulling them, whatever you want to do. Uh, in the early stages, don't get something where you need a machete to get through there to your pond. Oftentimes this is the stage we get calls at the extension office when there is no They've let it go three or four years, and then they decide they want to do something about it. That's not the time to take care of the problem. If you see this growth starting to come up, get control of it early on, or it'll save you time, money, and aggravation. I recommend glyphosate a lot, an aquatic registered glyphosate, uh, Catplex, Rodeo. There's a bunch of them out there. Uh, it's off patent now, so there's a bunch of them out there. Non-ionic surfactant is better for the environment. Uh, the surfactant won't be detergent based and won't kill fish and invertebrates out in the, in the water itself. Uh, here's one that I recommend. All kinds of different ones. I don't know. There's dozens of them out there. Again, fairly av readily available, not very expensive. Uh, use the proper surfactant and uh, it may take some multiple springs, especially on emerging green growth. Get it early in the year, May, June of the year. Uh, when the growth is still going, is still coming up, and this will translocate the chemical down into the root mass of these plants. That's the time to treat. Uh, Sidekick, one of the many uh, surfactants out there. This is a non-ionic one. There's all kinds of citrus-based oil, various oils, all kinds of different surfactants out there. Read the label, and uh, that, that should uh, get you in business. Water lily and water shield, these are two of the tougher ones that I, I, uh, I come across. This one's a real problem out in the eastern part of the state. I don't see it much in, in western Kentucky. Uh, water shield, especially out in the mountains, is real popular. Great duck forage. So if you want ducks, keep your water shield around. These things all have a habit of taking over an entire pond. The water, water lily calls I get, invariably somebody's gone to a, a feed store and bought one plant or two set it out there in a whiskey barrel, and by the time, a few years down the road, they've got half an acre worth of water lilies. These things drop real resistant seeds in the mud. These, these pretty flowers go away and they leave a seed down in the mud, and the seeds can last for decades in the mud. So there's a seed bank down there and the plants will keep coming up. Uh, they're very difficult to control once established, so think twice about planting these. I tell people, get a nice picture of a water lily, put it on the wall in your house, and don't put them out in your pond. Trust me, the picture will save you a lot of money. Uh, but there are things we can go after them with, 240 granular. Uh, Floridone's a good one, but very expensive. Um, they, are, they are tough to get rid of and will require repeated sprayings. Uh, Navigate, this is one I use. 
uh, quite a bit on, on some of these types of uh, tough, stubborn plants. Uh, an amine formulation is actually better than a granular. Uh, there are some amine formulations out there as well, a little more friendly to fish and pond environments uh, as a whole. Uh, just some submerged plants. Pond weeds, again, great duck forage. Can interfere with swimming, boating, and fishing. Uh, pond weeds are, they can get pretty thick, and, and sometimes grass carp will eat these, uh, these types of plants, but uh, they're very common throughout the state. There's a number of different species, or at least genus, uh, genre, I guess it's, is the appropriate term. Uh, diquat, salts, endothol, and fluoridone will all take these out. Fluoridone is sonar. Uh, problem with sonars is it's expensive. Uh, sonar, I've been, uh, all kinds of prices on this, roughly $1,800 to $2,000 a gallon. <coughs> this, uh, this discourages people a lot. Uh, yeah, right? Anyway, uh, so that's an issue. Uh, it is very good. If you decide to make, make the investment in sonar, know that the water in the pond has to stay there about 30 days. So would we have three or four inches of rain here the last few days? If you put sonar in there at this time of year, it'd probably go down the drain and you waste a lot of money. So if you try sonar, I would tell most people in our current climate situation, probably late summer, early fall is the time to put this in. Otherwise, you may not have the water retention time in your watershed ponds to keep this in residence for 30 days. So that's something to think about if you decide to write the check for $2,000 a gallon, which a lot of people don't. There are some other types out there Better for selective control, more spot treatments. All kind, CPRO has all kinds of different sonars out there. It's pretty hard to keep track of them all, but there are some other options. The bad news is a lot of these aquatic herbicides, once you get much beyond diquat, once you get beyond glyphosate, are pretty expensive. Uh, duckweeds, fluoridone is a, a good control over that. Uh, diquat, some of these others work pretty well. Uh, duckweed reproduces very quickly, and we have a lot of trouble with it in the summer months. And uh, it, it really comes down to nutrient loading in the water. If you can reduce the amount of phosphorus in your water, somehow, some way, run off of fertilizer, or manure, or whatever, you can potentially starve this stuff out over time. And that, that's really your best solution there. Phosphorus is bad. It's a limiting nutrient in fresh water. Once phosphorus gets into the pond muds, it cycles through the plant column, through the animal life in the pond, goes back into the mud. So you get a phosphorus cycle in the pond. It's hard to break that cycle without locking it up with uh, aluminum sulfate or phoslock or something like that. But just know that of all the nutrients in fresh water, phosphorus is the, the one you have to watch out for the most. A water meal, a cousin of a uh, of duckweed, it's the smallest vascular plant there is, and it's very difficult to control. Uh, we've got a three or about three chemicals that we can use to control water meal with, sonar, fluoridone being one of them, uh, flumioxazin, some others, they're all expensive. This is a very difficult plant to control. Again, you have to have residence time, 30 days or so in the pond. Uh, nutrients are always an issue, and uh, it, it's just simply the most difficult plant we have to control. And given the warmth of last summer and the length of it, we saw this pretty much throughout the summer. Usually, years past, I would see this late fall, late fall, uh, or mid midsummer, late fall, that or early fall, something like that. Now, I pretty much see it year round. Uh, so it is a problem, and probably the hardest plant we have to control. Uh, again, reading the label, the labels do change from year to year. Uh, as you would with anything, check, follow the label and the directions. Uh, the agents here, myself, uh, will be glad to help you. Uh, we can get a lot done nowadays via email and text messages and everything else. Um, here's my website right here. I'll be around through lunch if anybody's got any questions. Um, just some overall things to consider when you're managing your pond, just some summary. Uh, shallow areas less than two and a half feet in your pond, 
really you don't need depth much over eight or 10 feet, even with drought allowance and in, in, uh, taking into effect drought allowance. Uh, structure, two acres or less, probably not necessary in your ponds. Uh, you can put catfish containers out there in your ponds to encourage reproduction of small catfish. The problem is, is eventually the small catfish get away from the, the containers and get away from the brooding male catfish that watches over them and the bass come along and eat them. So if you want catfish in your pond, you're probably gonna have to stock large catfish in every few years uh, just to make up for the lack of reproduction that goes on there. This is a big one. Don't let your friends, neighbors, buddies, whoever, put fish in from other ponds or bait buckets. Really hard to get them out once they're in there and uh, they may not be doing you a favor. Uh, don't over harvest your bass. And some, and some things to do, fish the pond. You may wanna keep records. Keep some kind of records of how big the fish were and how many came out of your pond. That way you'll know just, uh, just what's going on out there. Uh, manage vegetation and water quality and control fishing access. I've got a friend that lets me fish his pond. Well, he started letting another guy fish and then pretty soon there were people from other towns and such fishing the pond. He had no idea what was going on out there. So uh, that, keep that in mind. You wanna have people fish your pond but you don't necessarily want the whole town there. People don't respect your property. They leave lying, beer, beer cans and garbage all over the place. It's sad, but it's true. Uh, control shoreline vegetation. And check the pond often and throughout the year. There's stuff going on out in ponds during the winter time. Just most people aren't aware of it because they don't really necessarily interact with that environment on cold, nasty days like this. But there is stuff going on out there. That's pretty much what I got. Any questions? Time for questions. All right, everybody wants to eat.